All right, so the first question that asks us to draw the structure of a phospholipid molecule. So we know that a phospholipid is made up of, so you would normally have your triglyceride molecule. So let us just read, so we're doing 2018, number one. And we're drawing a phospholipid. So if you remember to get the phospholipid, you would first have to have your tri disarray. So this structure here would represent the fatty acid tail. If you don't want to use this, you can go in and use carbon atoms. All right, so whichever you prefer. You can use this structure here because these lines, they are representing carbon atoms. So you can use this form, or you can actually draw out the carbon atoms, All right? whichever you prefer. And it must have a carboxylic group, the COOH. So it's child glycerin. We are going to have three fatty acids. And the molecule of glycerol. So the molecule of glycerol, it consists of three carbons with three OH groups. Let me bring it over a little, I don't want it too close. So we're doing the triglyceride first, then we're going to the phospholipid. Right, that is correct. So I'm just reminding you about the structure for the triglyceride first. Okay, right, so, so these are your three fatty acids. Right? And this is your molecule of glycerol. Now, you don't have to remember the actual chemical structure. You can just draw a box, right? And have your three OH groups sticking out. If you can remember this structure, that's good. If you cannot, you draw your box and put three OH on it, all right? Because it's the OH groups that are important. So this is your molecule of glycerol. So in order to join up these three fatty acids to the molecule of glycerol, just like last night when we were looking at polymerization and we join up two molecules by removing a molecule of, of water, we are going to do the same thing here. So we need to join up this group here, this carbon with this oxygen atom here. So let me just do this, all right, quickly. So to join up this carbon to this oxygen, we need to get rid of the OH from the, this group and the hydrogen from the OH, all right? So that is what we are going to remove each time. The OH from here and the hydrogen from here. So if we do that, if we do that, 
then this carbon is going to be bonded to this oxygen. So I'm just going to put the oxygen in the middle. Right. And so this now is your molecule of the tri glycerin. Three fatty acids and the molecule of glycerin. That is what makes the tri. So at this point, it's not a phosphate, it's a chai. Glycerin. Right? So that is the structure of the chai. Glycerin. If you want the phosphate, if you want the phospholipid node, we're going to remove one of the fatty acids and replace it with a phosphate group, all right? So the only difference between the triglyceride and the phospholipid is that the, tri, the triglyceride, it will have the three fatty acids bonded to the molecular glycerol. With the phospholipid now, We're going to erase one of the fatty acids. And we're going to add a phosphate group. I'm going to draw the chemical structure for the phosphate group. But again, if you're in the exam and you cannot remember it, just draw a circle. All right? And you write phosphate inside of it. One. So you can attach a phosphate with it here. So if you don't remember how to draw the chemical formula for the phosphate group, just at least indicate that you have your two fatty acids with your phosphate group. All right, so I'm going to do the actual structure and then we do a simplified version. So the phosphate group, it has four oxygen attached. So it's a phosphate with four oxygen, all right? So this is the phospholipid. I'm going to draw a second diagram, which is more simplified. So if you, if you remember this, that's fine. If not, we're going to do a simplified version of it. It also asks us to label each part on the phospholipid. So we know that this would have been the fatty acid tail, right? Which is hydrophobic. So this portion of it, of the phospholipid, this would have been the hydrophobic. Fatty acid tail. In this portion, remember the phosphate group is what makes it hydrophilic. So we have the phosphate group here. So we have the hydrophilic portion as well. I would normally say it's the hydro, hydrophilic head. All right, so normally described as the hydrophilic head. All right, so it's hydrophobic, fatty acid tail, and the hydrophilic head, the phosphate group. And so I can erase this and do the simplified version. Are you drawing? Drawing it, sir. All
it's 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 kind of so big because it has no polar groups on it. So because it's just carbon and hydrogen that makes up the fatty acid scale, that is why it is hydrophobic. And it's hydrophobic in relation to because it's because it is inside of the body, right? Which most of the environment is an aqueous environment. So it's hydrophobic in relation to aqueous environments. Is anybody still joining? Sir, I think you can clean now. So for the molecular glycerol, I just went to jar box, right? I remember we would have removed the hydrogen of the oxygen, right? So this would represent the glycerol and we can attach the phosphate group. And then you just add back the two fatty acids. All right. So this is the simplified version. You would label your phosphate group. So this is the phosphate group. If you draw the circle big enough, you can put phosphate inside of it. This here is the molecule of this around. And of course, this is the fatty acid tail. And again, this, this part would be the hydrophobic region. Right? So this part here it is still our hydrophobic region. And this part would be phosphate group is the hydrophilic region. All right, so that is for the telegram. Just do the check again. Is anybody ready? Right. So the next part of the question now it has asked us to describe how phospholipids are orientated. So, so if we draw this, we would get the marks. Yes, that is correct. So you draw it and label it. So if you remember the chemical structure join out all of the carbons and stuff, that's fine. But the simplified version, they can use it as well. So you just draw and label. All right. All right, so it says no. This kind of how phospholipids are orientated to form the lipid bilayer. So remember now, the phospholipids, before we describe it so, it helps to de describe it. You can draw it properly and label it. But no, all it has here in this case 
it does say this type of first Philippines are arranged. So it doesn't make mention of the other stuff that makes up the membrane. So we know that the first Philippine bilayer, the hydrophilic heads, all right? So the hydrophilic heads would, would face the external environment, right? To the aqueous solution. And the tail node, which are hydrophobic, would point inwards. So that's all we need to mention, right? So the bilayer, right? So I'm going to do it wrong. They should be. I'm going to trace the telegram. Someone's mic is on.
sir. Yes. It's in the hydrophobic um, region, the tail. Right. You're misplaced then. Where? The hydrophilic end faces the where? Up here? No, sir. The line above that where you said the hydrophilic region. No, I was. The, it was continuing from down here where I said. Oh. Yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Hydrophobic. Yeah, and he said, um, top right will change hydrophilic. Right. After you put hydrophilic region in brackets, you can put the head. And it's a hydrophilic region, which is the head, and the hydrophobic region, the tail. Is Ben Mother again still? Oh, yes, so give me a second, please. All right. So, the diagram that you drew was that necessary? Finish now. All right, so since you're on the by the lipid by there, it does just quickly draw a simplified version of it with the proteins in one. So it does just work on this. No, there is a particular. Go ahead, someone raised their hand. Somebody is asking the diagram that you drew is necessary. When you have to describe, if you can't explain good, you can work with the diagram. But you can just explain, you don't have to draw it. All right? Yeah. But they can ask you to draw it, right? So I'm going to actually draw the actual fluid mosaic now, right? So as we know, you will have the lipid by layer, and then you have a protein. And what do you know the name of the protein that goes straight across the through the two membranes? Right. But the general name for them is called what? Intrinsic. Yeah. Right. So you have your lipid bilayer, and then you have the protein that is able to span the entire lipid bilayer. 
And then you have a next one now that is kind of on this surface, but it's still a little inside, right? But not all the way like here, intrinsic protein. So this one is intrinsic. And this one is extrinsic. And then or someone was mentioning, right? On the actual surface of it, what can we have with structure? On the actual surface, like on the top of it. Like a, like a lipid. Right. And then, like a lipid. Right. They can just, right? And we have them sitting on. Sir, um, glycoproteins are like transmembrane proteins. So where, where would they be? No, these ones, they are on the surface. Because remember, so that's, that's like glycolipid or glycoprotein. The two of the glycolipid and the glycoprotein, they are on will the be surface. on the surface. And they're on top of cell signals. So I'm going to quickly just put some, put the functions of each of these. So we can have glyco lipids. Sir, so you went through like um what what the uh integral no you went through what the carrier protein and channel protein do like in terms of like transporting the no in the, in a few in a few minutes. So just put another one the glyco lipids. So just label one as glyco proteins as well. So on the surface, we will have glyco lipids and glyco proteins. And for extrinsic, it's also called peripheral. So we should have what terminals. And this one is integral. So the integral node would be your channel protein, right? As the person had said, but these are the general terms for any one that goes okay, through the the entire So any that goes through the entire membrane, the general term for it is the intrinsic or integral. And so the sorry, one that what goes, to cholesterol. Oh, I left that out. It will be like between one of the like fatty acids or something like that, or between. Um, I let me check for colors. I think it would have been embedded as well in the. Yes, sir. Like, yeah. So let's just do that. All right. So after after you finish here, I am going to put the functions, not with everything, but the major ones. So this wasn't a part of the question, but we're just recapping it, right? Since we were doing a little membrane question. And as you're finished, you can give me an indication so we can move on. Sir, so that join is the phospholipid bilayer. Right. So I know in the textbook I have some like fancy version. Just ensure if you're on the exam, you just put a little lipid bilayer insert your cholesterol, the intrinsic protein, the intrinsic one and your glycon lipids and proteins on top. So you don't have to waste time fancy it up. Just ensure you have your structures and your labeling. 
And we can also label the, the tails as well. So we could, so you can mention it, the hydrophobic tail and the hydrophilic head. So that should be easy to draw. And here the, the gap is wide, but when I join it, I can bring them closer. All right, is anybody still joined? All right, so I can edit. Right, so after this, we will return to the question. So the next question, it was this, to state the name of the lipid responsible for maintaining fluidity of cellular membrane. And if you look here, the one that can make it more or less fluid is cholesterol. 
So that uh, state the name of the liquid responsible for maintaining fluidity of the cellular membrane. All right, is anybody still writing from the board? Yes, sir. Right. Yes, sir. Just let me know when you're finished. Learning. All right, so the next question now it says describe the part B. Excuse me, sir, what is the function of glycolipid? So it has there more than one function, but this most popular one is that they act as recognition sites. So for us, when you want to bind or anything. All right, so when things want to cross the membrane, right? So remember, if it's two gases are able to pass through, right? But other substances that are too large are because of their polarity, they need help in crossing the membrane. And that is where the channel protein comes into play, right? They can get these substances across. Now it can be by facilitated diffusion where it would be moving from high concentration to low concentration. It can be active transport where we need ATP. So I'm going to put the diagram first and then we write about it. So Recording in progress. I'm just going to use this diagram here, as in this is representing our membrane. And in, embedded inside of the membrane, we would have the protein. Okay. Now, if so, remember this one is representing simple diffusion, right? So, no energy is needed. And in diffusion, we're moving from high concentration to low concentration. So let us say we have the molecules which are high in concentration on this side. So over here, we would have the high concentration 
right? And over here would have the, the low concentration. This mechanism is pretty simple, right? When any molecule binds to the protein, it causes the protein to change configuration. So all it is doing is basically picking up the molecule and bring it to this side. So once it binds, yeah, wouldn't that intrinsic protein like represent a carrier protein? That's the channel right. one would have it. Oh. Yeah, so well, so in this case, uh, I mean, it wouldn't be like simple diffusion, but like facilitated diffusion then. Yes, yes, yeah, yes, but yes, simple yes. diffusion is when it goes like through it the gets. membrane. Right, like yes. This is helping it out, right? Yeah. I'm just focusing on the part that it don't need energy. So it is facilitated because it cannot do it on its own. All right. So the molecule binds and the protein switches configuration and releases it onto this side. So we're taking it from high concentration to low concentration. Right. So your current it is possibly okay. So this diagram is basically showing you how the intrinsic proteins work. Right, is anybody still writing? Recording and
So what type of molecules are um like what type of particles are being transported? Like active transport. Would it be like iron ions and stuff like that? So so what type of particles are transported in facilitated diffusion? So remember, it depends. So remember with facilitated, it's in high concentration. So yeah, on the outside and low right. concentration on in the inside. So if you're if you want to move it from a low and point, you're asking like which molecule would be in a low concentration to move it. Or just yeah, within the out. cell. I mean, because I was thinking um like certain glucose molecules will right. be passed through by facilitated diffusion because i mean you wouldn't necessarily have a higher amount of glucose in the cell than outside like if you think of it you know but right. it can still be transported actively it just right. it just depends it would be from outside to inside so so that we facilitated facilitated diffusion and then i was thinking about like something like the sodium potassium pumping for like active transport or calcium pump or something like that based on the the three to two ratio this with the sodium and potassium ions yes the sodium potassium pump is active transport so um so first answer so the sodium is more in the in the um the sodium is more in the cell or or is it more in in the outside I'm not sure. okay. i know it was the you see that it already put us in. i don't remember exactly so i don't want to so so we don't we don't need to know that then no 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 man no it's just the mechanism for the sodium potassium pump you know, we look at that in details in unit two. But for first oh. for this year, we just need to be able we to just be focusing on the surface. Right. So I'm just focusing on how the the proteins actually move molecules across. Right. Yeah. All right, sir. Right. So basically, right. So the diagram that I drew on the board where we showed the protein picking up the molecules and then bringing it inside. Of the cell. All right. All right. So, all right, that would be it. All right. So, let's, let's see where was the next question coming from. All right. Oh, all right. So, I'm doing this again. So, part E. So, this is still question one. Part E. Is anybody writing? Can you use this? So they draw a chai, so they draw a chai guess a right, and then ask us to explain two features. So they do a try this right? And so we must now explain two features. All right, so the biomolecule they are referring to was the triglyceride that was drawn. And we know that the first, some of the major roles are as insulation, 
energy buoyancy in in wheels and other sea it is like short so insulation energy buoyancy and protection let me see if this can work insulation This was called protection. Sir. Yes. Sir, when you say boy and oh. Sorry. This is for protection. Sir, would the would the boy and say mean like put that um underscore like the elast the, the elasticity? Did I did I even say that right? The elast the, the elasticity, yeah. For um that they have. The elasticity. Mm -hmm. Or won't say really elasticity, but like so remember, like let me just write down the answer. But the buoyancy refers to like the ability to stay up in the water, right? Kind of like float. Okay. Right, but because okay. Uh, right. So remember, oil or flux, they are less, they are less dense than water. See, it look as if I, I, I didn't have a, a full, like, I didn't, I didn't know what buoyancy is then. Oh, yeah, but it's the ability, right? So basically, oh, it makes me talk with something else. Yeah. Oh. All right, see. So. Right, yeah. So because it's less dense, so it's not as heavy, right? I'm going to have to put it up here. Right. I'm going to erase the questions. Well, let me put energy next. Thank you. 
So the fats are actually, they release a lot more energy than glucose. So more than twice the amount of energy of glucose. All right, so that was question one. Sir, I have a protection. Say so we just we just talk about the cell membrane. Repeat that. Sir, for the for the function like protection, we can just talk about the cell membrane. No, so it's, protection. It, but it was referring to animals. So remember, it's for your organs. So remember, like if you are when people are delivering stuff, right, and they mm. put the styrofoam around it. Yes, sir. All right, so the in terms of a protective role, just imagine this terraform as the fat. So it is able to absorb certain sh shocks. So it doesn't, your organs they don't get damaged easily. So just imagine the, the said protection, just imagine this terraform around any thing that is being delivered, with a fridge store, anything. All right. All right. So it, Right, for protection, right? That's shock. That, that, that. All right, so for question two, hold on, was somebody asking a question? Yes, sir. What type of shock is our body going in? No, man. When it's a shock, like if I get any form of jerk or any hit, right? Oh, yeah, so, okay. Yeah, man. Oh, yeah, so, right. When it's a shock, yeah, it's like being hit here. Yeah. All right, so the only thing from that was came up was three stages. They gave us some stages for mitosis. The other stuff was genetics, which is not a part of the topic. All right, so I'm going to judge it three stages that was given. So when you say genetics, sir, you mean like pattern inheritance or something like that? Yeah, the oh. when the the diary and most of them high space. Okay. Okay. All right. So. So in what stage? All right. I'm going to judge three of them, and then you select. Mm -hmm. All right, so in which stage the, the chromosomes are not visible, they are not condensed. So in this in this stage, right, you cannot see the strands. So the chromosomes are not visible. So which stage is that? Interface. Interface, right. And the chromosome now, they have shortened and then so they have become visible. 
So which stage is this? Prophase. Prophase. All right. No, what we so this was on the exam, right? Now after prophase, let us draw a next cell. All right. Before you get to this stage, what would have happened to these? The line up in the middle. In the middle or the yeah. center. All right, so you just put them in the center. And then now, what will happen? Or what it's should I do? In the time, pull them back. Uh, they will be pulled to separate poles. Yeah, right. and of it, and of it. Right. So this spindle fibers attach. Yeah. And so which stage is this? Metaphase. And so once they are pulled apart now, we will get anaphase. Anaphase. And then what will happen after anaphase? Telophase. Right. So you will start to see uh, nuclear membrane forming. Right. Okay. All right. So you will start to see the indentation. Right? So we just put that. And when they finally separate, what would that be? Cytokinesis. Mm. Right. So when the chromosome is not visible, that's interphase. Then at the first part where they become visible as, so they go say they condense, so you can see the different strands, that would be the prophase. Then they will line up at the equator, which is metaphase. They get pulled apart by the spindle fibers. And we have anaphase. And then now you will see the cell at the first cell. You will see it starts to separate. But when it actually separate, that is cytokinesis. All right. But for the question that was on the exam, they just gave us to identify prophase, interphase, and anaphase. All right. All right, so from module three, part of it that would fall under what we are doing, they gave us a cross section of a mature pollen. All right, so what everybody is finished with what is on the board? Yes, sir. All right. The question was for a stone, namely. 
So it's a cross section. Sir, um, can you repeat the question, sir? Oh, so this is the cross section of the pulling grain. They are drawing it with the labels. So all you're supposed to do is label it. Oh. Yeah. Can I erase the board again? Was somebody writing?
Um, excuse me, sir. Yes. Sir, I want to ask you something. Just not too long. Wake up in the sir. Okay, if I chop me, get chop, sir. So like, are we are we able to right now, sir? All right, it's a record still, but we are looking based on the topics. We look at the ones that came from the twenty eighteen past paper. So currently, we were looking at the access to describe the events in double fertilization. Someone had asked a while ago if we should include when it land on the stigma, when it just land. So if you want to include right as it lands, you can, you can start there. All right, so time is going. Um, is anybody still writing? And so it asks for the significance of double fertilization. That was the last part of it. So what time are you ending again? Uh, I had said nine. What time is it now? Alright, well. Yeah, we can continue. All right, so significance of double fertilization. That was far too. All right, so that was for that. And then the, the question four, it, it didn't relate to our topic. So for question five, which is module two, we are going to look at transcription. So once we finish here, the question for question five, that's about transcription.
Is anybody writing? All right, so for this question, it says we need a label theorem. This is twenty eighteen. All right, so it's the awesomeness user diagram to show all information stored in the gene. Remember, a gene is just a segment of DNA, a specific segment of DNA that codes for a protein. So it is asking us now how is that information in the DNA is transferred to or is used to make RNA. So let us go. Let me ask the question. All right, does anybody know the steps in transcription? Can I hear the question? Is it? Not yet, sir. All right. <laughs> Can Chris know? Yes, sir. All right, so let us go back to where we have our two strands of DNA. Sir. Yes. Sir. No hey, can I repeat the question, please? Uh, it has said, with the aid of a label diagram, with the aid of a label diagram, explain how information the diagram explain how information stored in gene is used to synthesize RNA. So it's basically allows to explain transcription. I don't know for transcription, we are going from DNA to messenger RNA. Sir. And this, yes. I have a question, sir. <laughs> sir, if we choose not to like dry the way how we enjoy it, sir, we have the five prime to three prime at the top and the three prime to five prime at the bottom. Um, would that be okay? Like, same way. Yeah, Right. You can put three, yeah, man, just make them right, doesn't matter because you will still know which strand to use. Right. All right, so we're going from DNA to messenger RNA. The first thing that we need to know, right, because we are not going to copy both of the strands, 
one of these strands will be copied. Just like when you're making a new strand of DNA, when you're making RNA, so you need to remember messenger RNA is synthesized, is synthesized in a five prime to three prime direction. This is very important in selecting which of these channels will be used as the template. Right? So messenger RNA synthesizes in a five prime to three prime direction. You also need to understand what is the template trend. So the template strand is the DNA strand. Three prime to five prime. That is correct. So, because RNA is made in a five prime to three prime direction, and remember everything is, is must run anti parallel. So, if this is being made five to three, this strand is going three to five. So, RNA is made five to three, and these two strands are from our DNA. So this strand, the three prime to five prime strand, is the one that will be used to make the RNA. So this strand on your DNA, that is the template strand. So your lagging strand. So in DNA replication, the strand that you put called the lagging strand, that is the template strand in transcription. And the leading strand, it would be the non-template because it is not being used to make the messenger RNA. So the template strand is the one from which RNA is made. So this is your messenger RNA. Cool. Other than it being called the template strand and the non-template strand, we're going to call them coding and non-coding strand. Your template strand, that one is the non-coding strand. And I'm going to explain why. So, so that's all you enjoyed? This? No, man. As in for the diagram? No. No, 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 no. This is not it. All right. I'm just explaining a little thing first. Then I'm going to draw the diagram that you are supposed to use. So this is not the diagram. All right. I can erase this portion of the board. So when you draw your diagram, you must know which is template, which is non-coding. Your template strand, it is also called the non-coding strand. And I will show you why shortly. And the non-template is the coding strand. All right. So your protein will actually be built from the non-template. But we will see why. So I'm going to put the diagram on the board now. So template is non-coding, non-template is the coding strand. Right, 
sir. Yes. The thing you had on the board about template and non-template with coding, mm -hmm. what, you, what, what was it? No, you have to know the, what, so the two strands. So just like in replication, we call one the leading strand and one the login strand based on certain events. In replication, the strands are given names again. So we call one of them the template strand because that is the one from which RNA will be made. The template strand is also called the non-coding strand. And we're going to see why shortly. So for the diagram, this is it. So we're to use a diagram to explain how RNA is made from a gene. So this is the diagram we are going to use. So, when you have your DNA, right? Well, the first thing that happens for transcription is that a portion of it, not at the end, somewhere in the middle, is opened up. Right? So RNA polymerase are based on where you check, you might say DNA EKs. Right? So the first thing that happens is a portion of the DNA is opened up. All right, hence is why you see I have it like this. Right. And then whatever is behind it is still base theory, so not open up. So this is what happens first. All right, let me put back five prime, three prime, three prime, five prime. And you can put some bases on it. So let us say this is A, G. This is DNA, so it cannot be T. A, C, C, T. Up here, we go down what? T, C, A, T, E, G, G, A. Right. Good? No. Once it is on one now, right? This strand is what we're going to use to make our RNA. So remember we said RNA is made five prime to three prime. The enzyme in this now, the enzyme that we're using, so I'm just going to explain it quickly and then we'll break the steps. RNA polymerase is what is going to add the complementary nucleotides to make your messenger RNA. So DNA polymerase is for DNA replication. RNA polymerase is for transcription, right? So RNA polymerase. Wait, is sir, can you what I just said before, please? So about, about the RNA polymerase. So just like with replication, we open up the DNA and then DNA polymerase would go along and add the nucleotides. With transcription, it's RNA polymerase. RNA polymerase. All right. So, so, sir, so sir, the DNA will still, this DNA um, helicase will still come and separate the hydrogen bonds and then RNA polymerase come after? No, it depends on which was they say RNA polymerase, but some little DNA. Okay. okay. So different in analytics, it says RNA polymerase. Next, so DNA helicase. All right, so I'm going with RNA polymerase. So the DNA strand, there's a portion of it, a specific portion, you open it up, right? The RNA polymerase, it will bind to the template strand because it is being made five prime to three prime it attaches to the strand that is three prime to five prime. And it will go along and add the complementary nucleotides. All right, I'm just going to erase these letters for a second. So it will start to add, right? And when it add the complementary nucleotides, it will start to get longer and longer, right? 
you know, it doesn't stay attached to the nucleotide. So what you will notice as the, the, the RNA polymerase, it goes along and in the nucleotides, the length of your messenger RNA continues to increase, but it doesn't stay attached to the nucleotides. So you will see the length of it increasing. That will continue until the RNA polymerase reaches a sequence that tells it to stop. So it reaches a stop signal. And when it gets there now, that is when the, R, the messenger RNA comes off. So that is how you will get your messenger RNA. So it actually occurs in three steps. Initiation, elongation, termination. Initiation is where it binds. Then once it starts adding, that is elongation, because the messenger RNA, the length of it, the more nucleotide it adds, it is getting longer. Until it reaches a stop sequence, it comes off. All right. Last thing, why is this the coding strand? And why is this the non-coding strand? This was A, this was G, this was A, this was A, no, this was T, A, C, C, T. Your messenger RNA sequence, it would have read, where you have A, what would go for A? If it's messenger RNA, when you have A, what you, would you have? Right. So where you have A, you would have U, where you have G, we would have C. Where you have T, what would we have? A. All right. Then U, G, G, A. Look at your messenger RNA sequence and look at this. What do you notice? Except for the U's and the T's, what do you notice about the two of them? Sorry, it is the same, right? So even though you copy this strand, because it is made complementary, so this strand, this is complementary to this, and this strand is complementary to this strand. So when you copy this, you're basically making this one. And remember, when this goes to the ribosome, this is what is being used make the protein. So it's basically the code. Whatever is in this strand, that is what they actually leave the nucleus with. So that is why this is your coding strand and this is the non-coding one. Because this is not these sequence here, they are not going to be translated. These are going to be translated. All right. So if we were to draw this, we can label this strand non-coding, coding strand. All right, slash template, non-template, all right? So this is the diagram I am going to explain. I'm yes, sir. It in steps now, yes? Sir, so right. when, when we're drawing it, so we just draw one circle representing the RNA polymerase and we right. draw the string thing coming out. Yes, so, right, cause you have to show, right, elongation. So we would remove the bases and you can put the string here and show it coming off. So you would have to put the polymerase in front because it is the polymerase that is doing it, right? And sir, if you want to be fancy, sir, we can use like um, the, co the coding strand, sir, here and just where we have T, put U1, just so that's for M, right. Yes. Yeah. So you can still put in the, what is this? So you can still put up the A, the G, T, T, right? And let the messenger RNA stay out here. Okay. All right, so quickly, I'm going to um, All right, yeah. give a little description on the three stages, all right? Remember, three stage, initiation, elongation, termination. The polymerase is heading in this direction. The 
When you open up the book here, we just start it from here. So if we say it is made five prime to three prime, and we're going in this direction, then this is the strand. If you open it up and want it to do it in this direction here, your polymerase would be on this strand. If you are going in this direction. So which you can can just you can just repeat why the template strand would be the non-coding strand again, sir. All right. So the template strand is a non-coding, all right? And the reason for that, the RNA polymerase is going to add complementary nucleotides to what is on your template strand. So where it's A, it will put U. Where it's G, it will put C. So when you finish making RNA, it will not look like the, the template strand. It will look like the other strand, the non-template one, because it is having the opposite of what it sees. So if it sees G, it is not put in G, it is put in C. When it sees T, it put A. So both of these, so your messenger RNA and the non-template are the same because the non-template strand is complementary to this one. And your messenger RNA is complementary to this strand as well. So that is why both of these two end up being the same. And remember, we are calling the code because that is what is going to be used to make your protein. All right. I know some never hear we say a while ago, sir. Sorry to bother you, sir, but can you just repeat that once, once more, sir? This is a template strand, RNA polymerase. When it attaches, it is, if it sees an A, it is going to add U. Where it's a G, it will add C. Complementary bases, right? So when it adds complementary bases, you'll notice it will match up with what is up here. So C, C. A, A. So this is the coding strand. This is what is actually in your messenger RNA. Except for where of T, you would have had a U. All right. And this is what is going to go to the ribosome and gets translated. I'm going to write the explanation now, yes. All right. So I'm going to erase this and put the explanation. Um, sir, do you have to erase the bases when you're showing elongation? Please repeat. Do you have to erase the bases on the template strand when you're showing elongation? If I have to erase the bases when I'm showing elongation? Yes, sir. No, you don't, no, you don't have to erase it. I can just put the polymerase further down. So if you have the A, 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 C, T, you can just put the polymerase here and the strand here. That means it would have already read what was here. All right? Okay. Yeah. Right, let me just read about the question. Sorry.
The only enzyme we need to remember for this process is RNA polymerase. It's the DNA replication that we need to remember the name of several enzymes. Sir, this is the general synopsis of what protein synthesis is. This is not protein synthesis. Protein synthesis is when you make, is a, so synthesis means to make, so if you say protein synthesis, you are making protein. This is messenger RNA synthesis. So transcription is messenger RNA synthesis. Translation is protein synthesis. Okay, sir. Right? Yeah, so we are looking at messenger RNA synthesis. Right, so as soon as I finish, is anybody still writing? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right, so as soon as I finish, just give me an equation. Okay, thank you. Because I want to also touch on genetic engineering. Mm -hmm. Sir, by what time will this class end? I have to end it by nine. What time is it now? Eight or nine? All right, so I want to wrap up this question and touch genetic engineering. Sir, are we going to be doing the past paper? Please repeat. Are we going to be doing the past paper? I'm not sure. All right, if I get the exam is at one o'clock, I have, to end at, I have to end at nine, right? Okay, I'm trying, I'm going to try and write answers to some other questions and just take a picture and upload it as a video. So just place it in a video form and just pause and look at the answer. Right, but I will have to end at nine because I have to go to school. So let's say somewhere about 11 o'clock, I will try to answer some quickly. I'm not sure if you will have the time to look at it. But I'm just going to write the answer, say so it will it will not be a video where I will explain it, right? I will just write it and take a picture and upload it. All right, so you can just sir, so when are you going to post this, sir? No, as class finish by about 15 minutes afterwards, I will post it. But the written answers, I will try to do it by 11. All right. Thank you. Yeah, All right, so three stages, right? The three stages are initiation, I'm just going to tell what happened in each stage. So initiation, Where I have the DNA double helix is separated, put a portion, so it's not all of it. All right, so the portion of the DNA double helix is separated.
And so in initiation, the only double helix is unwound, so a portion of it opens up. RNA polymerase it binds to a specific region. If you don't remember the name, if you don't remember Kamala, just remember that RNA polymerase will bind. All right. All right, so we won't go into much detail details for initiation, but if you do this further like in university, this process is a lot more detailed. All right, but for now, just remember RNA polymerase on the template strand, it binds to a specific region, so it don't bind any, anywhere. It's a specific region right, called the promoter region. All right, and that is where transcription begins. Say you said that the non-template strand it reforms with the nuclei nucleotides by DNA polymerase. Repeat. The, the non-template strand it reforms yes. with the nucleotides by DNA polymerase, right? No, they just so remember actually you see in, in DNA replication after helicase unwinds the DNA. So we don't mention this step, but to keep the strands from base pairing again, single stranded binding proteins actually attach to the bases or else you would have base pairing occurring again. So once the RNA polymerase attaches the complementary nucleotide and moves along, remember the, R, remember the messenger RNA, it's not attached to it, it comes out, right? That means the DNA that is left behind, it will reform. So base pairing will occur again. So it's not DNA polymerase that is doing anything. So RNA polymerase makes the messenger RNA moving along. And so the two strands, so the strands and the DNA, so A and you have T down here, they will base pair again. All right, messenger RNA is out here. Sorry, RNA polymerase is out here. The base is left here. They will pair up again. Right. So the helix will reform. Right. So okay, sir. Thank so you. That's, yeah, that's initiation. Let's look at elongation. Elongation is pretty straightforward, right? So all uh, that will happen is that RNA polymerase moves along. So
sir, you have initiation. So go to the inundation. Sorry, the initiation, sir. Now, uh, though I'm giving you this much info, okay, and the exam, what you must just ensure that you remember is that the elongation or any polymerase just goes along the template strand and add complementary nucleotides. And that is why the chain becomes longer. So that is, so elongation is just the messenger RNA getting longer and it gets longer because the RNA polymerase is moving along your template strand and in the complementary nucleotides. All right, so on the exam, just remember RNA polymerase moving along the template strand and adding complementary nucleotides. If you can remember these, sure, but at least remember that RNA polymerase moves along and in complementary nucleotides. And so the length of your missing the RNA increases. I think if anybody is still writing. Yes, All I have it. All right, I can hear you now. Is anybody writing?
And so in termination, the messenger RNA, it reached not the messenger RNA, the RNA polymerase, it reaches a sequence that tells it to stop. And so at that point, the, the messenger RNA is completely removed. So that is where the transcription would end. You normally have messenger RNA processing because at this part, messenger RNA is not ready yet for translation. Right? So other modifications are done. So for transcription, that is where it would stop. Right? Now I want to look at genetic engineering quickly and just walk about through the process of what happens in genetic engineering. Right? I will send the answer, a question and an answer on translation. Right? But I have to look at genetic engineering to see if you remember the process. Right, so when you're writing genetic engineering, right? so genetic genes, engineering, some form of technology. So we're basically manipulating. I'm going to write it, take a pic and upload it to the channel as well. And so I won't be doing a video. I'm just going to write it and upload it. All right, so genetic engineering, right? We're just manipulating the genome, whether of animal, plants, humans, right? So we're doing some form of modification. To, to a G, right? But we're using technology to do it, right? So for example, insulin, right? Back in the days, if you had diabetes, both in the 70s or early 80s, up to that point, before DNA technology had improved and restriction enzymes, all of those stuff were discovered, right? If you, had, if you had diabetes, you would get insulin from pig, right? Pig insulin. However, with river component DNA technology, we are able to isolate the insulin gene, right? Place it inside of what we call a plasmid, circular strand of DNA in a bacteria, put it back in the bacteria, the bacteria replicates. When it is replicating, it is also it has the insulin gene, and the gene is a cone. So once it has the cone for insulin production, it will produce insulin. And so we're able to manufacture insulin on a large scale basis. Right? So let us just look at the steps that would be involved. So let us just use insulin production to explain genetic engineering. All right. So let us just say of the human, right? And we're going to isolate it, the insulin gene. So we take the insulin gene from the human gene. We are going to have a bacterial cell now. Bacteria a prokaryotic in a prokaryotic cell. It will have circular strands of, well, not circular, but just circular strands of the DNA, right? And then now if you have one so bacteria, it has a circular DNA. 
that we call the Tazmi. And what your should should have us said about. So this is the chromosome man, DNA. DNA. Well, this is the plasmid DNA. All right. And it is the plasmid DNA that is used. So what we're going to do, right? We have the insulin gene and the plasmid DNA. We so isolate the gene from the humans and we are going to isolate the plasmid. So we're going to remove the plasmid from the bacteria. All right. So we remove the plasmid from the bacteria and of the insulin gene. Let us say, what's that also? Let us say that this is our insulin gene. All right. So this right here, this is our insulin gene. We're going to place the insulin gene inside of the plasmid. All right, so let's just put it in terms of some steps, right? So the human will be the host, all right? So we're going to remove the gene from the host cell. So step one, you would have a, whether it's plant or animal or humans, the gene of interest, you are going to remove it from the host. In this case, it's the insulin gene that we are removing. Good. Step two, we are removing plasmid DNA from the bacteria. So that is, that would be step two, right? Just getting what is needed. So we have the insulin of the plasmid in step three. Step three now, we are going to make recombinant DNA. So we are going to combine the insulin gene with the plasmid DNA. And so this is now what we call a combinant. DNA. So we are mixing DNA from two sources. Right? Insulin, plasmid, mix both of them. So in step three, we get our recombinant DNA. I will have to erase the board after this. So let me know when you're finished with this information. Sir. Yes. So you have isolation, then the removal of the plasmid, and you have insertion to make the recombinant DNA. Right. So, so you're, you're isolated. So it's isolation of the gene from the host. Then you remove the plasmid from the bacteria, and then you insert the gene into the plasmid. So let me just put that insert gene. So for step three, we insert, insert the gene into the plasmid. All right, so for step three, 
we insert the gene into the plasmid. And for step four, we are going to put the recombinant DNA back into the bacterial cell. And so for step four, this will be going back into the bacteria. All right, so is anybody still writing at the board? Yes, sir. All right. Finish now. Sorry, can I step four? I'm going to do step four now. All right. So I'm going to drive up and do it. So one, remove gene from host, remove plasmid from bacteria, then combine the gene with the plasmid DNA and you get recombinant DNA. So I'm going to do step four now. So would that mean like um would, would the name of that be implantation where you implant but we implant the plasmid back into the bacteria or something like that? Well, I guess I could use that term. I haven't seen it used before, but you can use it and explain it. All right. So if you want to use it like that, all right, no problem. All right. So we insert the recombinant DNA back into the bacteria. And what do we know about bacteria? How do they replicate? Um, binary fusion. Binary fusion, right? So now what will happen? All right, so let us put back the plasmid into the bacteria. Well, the recombinant. All right, so remember, you will have the chromosomal DNA, and then now inside of it, you will have your recombinant DNA. And the thing about the plasmid they realize that when the bacteria replicates, the plasmid is also present in the new generation as well. So the, not only the chromosomal DNA is replicated, the plasmid also. And so once you put the recombinant DNA inside of it, when this bacteria replicates, your recombinant DNA is also being replicated. All right, so step four, sorry, not step four, step five, our bacteria is going to replicate. And so we will get many recombinant DNA being produced. Right. And also remember a gene, so a gene is a code, right? When codes are translated, it leads to a result, right? So if this is an insulin gene, once it is inside the bacteria, the gene now is giving the bacteria the ability to produce insulin. So the bacteria now has the ability to produce insulin. Once the code is translated, they get insulin. All right, so step five, the bacteria. Yeah, so this is just a so this is a simplified version, sir. So what the hard part? Hmm? Yeah, this is a simplified version, sir. Where is the hard part? No, only some for like legit in a real life. Yes, sir. But the hard part is genetic engineering, sir. Where is it? Yes, sir. Because you know, I mean, repeat stories where yeah, I the hard to go part, for genetic sir. engineering. Well, like the enzyme we used to cut the 
Like oh, the name. restriction enzyme. That yeah, like method. So that's the hard part. And so we would use right, we use restriction enzyme to cut the DNA. So isolate the gene. Right. So if when you are inserting it, right, a restriction enzymes, and you have different enzymes that do the different types of cuts. All right, but the exam is not few. Like couple also at this point. Yes, sir, we need to know a different enzyme. Mm -hmm. I'm going to check back this levels. If you have to, I will post it in an answer. All right. So, yeah. But at least ensure, because the exam is not few hours, ensure you know the process. All right. If you can add details to it, fine. But you will get your marks for listing what happens. Because what happens, you isolate a gene, remove the plasmid, put the DNA inside of the plasmid, put it back into the bacteria. And now our bacteria is going to replicate. Yes, sir. So we so as a scientist are doing doing the whole putting back the plasmid into the bacteria. We're going to observe to see if the production of insulin is suitable or desirable. If it's desirable to be, I'm not as sure. In like, as in like, if it, if it works, like if insulin is being produced by the bacteria. Yes, it is going to be secreted. In the, so they, they, well, they have different techniques, but the insulin, it would have been secreted and they have their way of collecting it. I don't, I didn't do research the exact way in which it is collected. But when the but if it produces means it is going to secrete the enzyme. Sorry, not the enzyme. It will secrete your insulin and okay. it will be collected. But in terms of the exact procedure in which it is collected, I'm not certain. Mm -hmm. But if you do molecular biology or biotech analogy, you will go in more details and understand it. it. It's actually an interesting area to do, all right? If it was a regular class, we would go in more details and look at some other stuff and, and application, all right? But unfortunately, we just have to try and catch the process. All right, so step five, the, the Replication, all right? So our bacteria, it will replicate. I'm going to drag a little smaller and so just very quickly. If you want, you can, where you have the replication, you can, if you remember, you can just mention that, so the bacteria will actually be good, right? It has to be an medium. So you would have your growth medium for your bacteria. Right? So it's not like the bacteria is in an isolated space. They're actually growing really big. Bacteria, so you would have the growth medium and the bacteria. You would just see them as little colonies, right? So it's not like you will actually see the bacteria like this. Right? So what you would see on the surface are what you call colonies of bacteria. So this this little spot here represents a lot of bacteria. So when you say the bacteria is replicating, if you do it like the actual experiment, right, you do see like little spots on the growth media 
and that is when your bacterium, the bacterium, it could have multiplied to make a lot of copies within 24 hours, 24 to 48 hours, we'll have a lot of bacteria being produced. All right. Eric, can you repeat what you say step four was again? Step four, what did we mean step four? We would have inserted but the plasmid or the recombinant DNA into the bacteria. So in replication, what we would have done, we would have placed the bacteria in growth medium. Mm -hmm. All right, now genetic engineering, it doesn't just apply to insulin production. So Papa, for example, Papa, corn as well. So in Papa, you have this virus that affects Papa called the Papa ring spot virus. So to prevent that, one professor out here, she did it as well, but I don't know if they allow it out here as it, but in Hawaii, you have transgenic papa. So transgenic, so they are basically, what they did was to give the papaya the ability to withstand the effect of the virus. So they had to insert a gene. And once that gene is inside of it, it does not affect the virus, no longer affects the papa. There was a next instance, a long time ago, right? When I was in university, we, we learned about it. So with fish, because we know fish can survive the cold temperature, right? So they wanted fruits, I think it was tomato, either tomato or orange, don't remember, to be able to survive the winter. And so they took a gene, so I think they figured out which gene allowed the fish to, serve, to survive. And they put that gene inside of the tomato. But that was the tomato or orange to give it the ability to survive the cold, right? But I think the flavor or something else was affected, right? But the point is with this aspect, when you take a gene, the gene is giving the ability to something else. Because remember, you know, we said gene is a code, and if the code is translated, it will lead to something. So just like the this ones um, here. To produce um, proteins and stuff that, I'm saying that the genes would be expressed and give the, the organism exactly. right. abilities so, to do so or whatever. Right, so just like here, we just gave the bacteria the ability to do what? To produce it's insulin, insane. right? So with certain, the disease, right? If we could, certain genetic disease, if we can insert or put certain gene, well, that is a goal which would lead to the question I'm going to answer on the board. When you talk about genetic engineering, especially with animals and humans, there's a lot of concern, right? I'm sure yes. some of you may no, hear it. Especially with genetically modified foods as well, right? Which would include the papa. And every corn as well is genetically modified. And um, seedless grapes and. Exactly. Right. So a lot of things are. Spanish rice, modified. yellow rice, and all that foolishness. The golden it's not rice. foolishness in a sir. I, I kind of like those stuff, but you know. Yeah. If you understand it, I'm telling you, it's not like I can just go inside a lab. I'm just saying I'm going to make something, you're just going to insert a gene in something and then, re and then release it. It is a very rigorous process to take years. It doesn't have to be approved, all right? So it's not like I can just go, I'm going to do something and release it. 
and they have to be a lot of tests, all right? And all, all it is a long process, all right? So, but again, we don't have the you know, time, unfortunately, to go into it, right? So this is the general process for any form of genetic engineering. Now, this part of it, if it does not involve the bacteria that is being produced, right? So let's say it was the papa. Once we figure, once you insert the gene in the papa, that is where it would end, all right? So it would end in step four. So where you insert the transgene, where you insert the recombinant DNA back into the organism, that is where the process would end. But because with insulin, we want to collect our insulin, so the bacteria, we are showing the final stage, we would actually go the bacteria, so we get a lot of them producing the insulin. But in the general application, regardless of whether we're dealing with animals or humans or plants, it would end when we put the recombinant DNA inside of the organism, all right, which would be step four. So you have the gene of interest, you make some modification to the gene and put it back into the organism. And that You've muted yourself, sir. Sir, I'm mute. Sir, you are muted, sir. All right, sorry about that. All right, so there was this question from 2017. It said to outline the principles of, outline the principles, all right, let me put it on the board. All right, so I'm just going to do this question and then I have to end there, all right? So the principles of genetic engineering. This one on genetic engineering, I took it from 2017. And it asks us to outline
but I'm going to seriously question. Excuse me, sir. I know you have to go after this, but um, can you talk about the Cryptocast 9, please? The genetic modification for the cystic fibrosis thingy. Right. Um, yes, no, actually, I'm going to try and write it and upload it because if the person that's waiting on me has to get something signed up at school and hand them the moderator. So okay. I, will have to try, yeah. I will have to try and write on it and upload it as well. All right. Yeah. I'm just trying to finish this. Thank you. Yeah, man. All right. So, all right. I can, I can erase up here now, right? All right, in some cases, right, the, the gene, you would, have to, you would have to use something to deliver the gene 
So in some cases, so even like viruses are used as vectors. So we are in with the insulin, we put the once you have the transmitted DNA, I can just put it directly into the bacteria. Remember, bacteria are unicellular organisms, right? But they also have multicellular organisms in which we perform genetic engineering experiments with. In that case, your gene, you have to put it inside a vector, right? So the vector is what will carry your gene into the host. All right. So if it's outside of where we are just inserting a gene into a bacteria, if I put it into animal, plants, humans, we would need a vector. All right. And then we would insert the vector into the host. And so we got basically some of the steps. All right. The other part is that for the Take the picture and post it, all right? Real quick. It talks about some concerns. That's a disparate promising potential. One argument sometimes raised against the use of gene therapy is it's technically too dangerous, all right? But I'm going to have to take the picture of that part and upload it, all right? So, uh, of to him here.